Today may seem like just any other Thursday, and for the most part, you might be right. But the significance is gained from two years ago to the day. March 10th, 2020, a day that changed Call of Duty for better or for worse, depending on your viewpoint, forever. Today is the two-year anniversary of Warzone's launch. Throughout that time, we've seen countless gunfights, dozens of map changes, and even an entire map change itself, alongside countless memories made perhaps throughout that span that, to me, it warrants a discussion of the full evolution of Warzone, a two-year look back at where we've been and how we got to where we are today. So today, as we go along, let me know your thoughts down below. What was your favorite season? Favorite weapon or meta? Favorite drop spots out of the last two years? What's the absolute best you've done? Whatever the case, drop your thoughts below. If you'd also be so kind, drop a like on the video. This is for sure a way more in-depth video. While scripting and voicing over this portion, I have no idea where this will end up, but our last video kind of like this ended up being around 25 minutes long. So if you look at that time bar below and it's anywhere near that or beyond, buckle up because we've got a good ride ahead. But drop a like on the video. This is a significantly more in-depth project than others we normally do, so hopefully enjoy it. As well, if you're new to the channel, you'd like to see more of this kind of stuff while following Warzone in the future and what may be Modern Warfare 2 in the future, hit that subscribe button. We're on the road to half a million subscribers slowly but surely, but I'd love to have you in the community. And finally, my friends over at G Fuel in celebration of Warzone's two-year anniversary have bumped up code Espresso to 30% off your entire order, so if you're looking to get something for the first time, grab a restock, whatever the case, now is as best a time as any. But that said, let's jump into Warzone's two-year anniversary and the complete evolution that we've seen since its inception. To understand Warzone entirely, we have to turn back the clocks quite a bit, before the even two-year mark. 137 days, or four months and 14 days before the launch of Warzone, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019 was released to the world. The build-up and the anticipation to Modern Warfare 2019 was palpable, and perhaps for rightful reasons. From settings and stories that didn't quite hit the mark, to incomplete feelings in some games, there was plenty of anticipation to have that ability to return to a setting, a cast, that all felt familiar and felt like home to those that had played during the golden years of Call of Duty. Perhaps that feels familiar now with the rumored Modern Warfare 2 on the horizon, and perhaps for the exact same reasons. But Modern Warfare's anticipation was met with much acclaim right out of the gate, bringing in new and returning fans to the franchise. While the stellar campaign gripped those who loved single player, the multiplayer connected, or didn't connect depending on who you ask, with those that loved MP, Spec Ops was the third mode introduced here, which was under the the radar. It wasn't the best mode by any means and was plagued with issues, to this day still even in some capacity, but it was the offering that would lead to much more in the future, unbeknownst to us. It was our first introduction alongside the ground war maps to the world of Verdansk. Spec Ops was a cover for the battle royale to come later down the line, setting up this entire world. But what's even more fascinating is that our first look at the entire scope of battle royale came nearly three weeks after the launch of the game, still months before the mode would actually release. Renowned data miner known as Senesalo on Reddit had been keeping tabs on upcoming items from Modern Warfare since its first playable builds were made public. At this point, he had accurately revealed cut Modern Warfare 2019 content like Dead Man's Switch, essentially Dead Man's Hand from Modern Warfare 3, and a cut Fuel Bomb Airstrike Streak. He revealed gunfight tournament rewards months before they were implemented. He revealed the enlisted and seasonal ranking system, 250 plus operator skins, all 23 wristwatches planned, 200 plus blueprints from launch going through season one and two, all gestures, all base weapon camos, pre-CDL camo integration, even those ones that were so rare you probably never saw them, all weapon charms, all multiplayer maps, some of which are still even missing to this day or cut content, all modes, all spec ops missions, and some of the upcoming and cut operators for future DLC. Point being, this guy knew his stuff, knew what he was looking for, and all of it was true which made his post on November 16th of 2019 even more interesting when it was listed as Battle Royale coming to Modern Warfare, Map, Locations, Perks, Plunder, Gulag, and more. Now, we're going to be breaking this down perhaps later in a future video talking about things that are just kind of fascinating to see that we never ended up seeing how Battle Royale could have been entirely different. But staying on track here, when you consider it to have all of that leak out nearly four months ahead of schedule, that has to be a nightmare as a developer who wanted to keep things under wrap. But for us, that was our first accurate depiction of what was to come. Now, as for the build-up to launch, Modern Warfare's first season launched in December of 2019 and brought with it a lot of things that were new to Call of Duty at the time. The Battle Pass system as we know it, blueprints in the shop that we have in its current format, our first ever free DLC bulk drop, so Season 1 was given specifically to Modern Warfare, all attention granted to the mainline game. However, Season 2, that's where things started to get interesting. In the weeks leading up to Season 2, we had our first sort of in-game marketing really kick off. Ghostface was seen scattered across various TV screens in the maps, Piccadilly's main and massive screens would flash his face. This is kind of the beginning of what was to come. However, when that update came, the biggest teaser out of that 
was something that we had never seen before. With season one, we ended up getting an intro cinematic for that season where our allegiance and coalition forces were fighting on Crash while Alcatala watched from Verdansk TV stations. Season two, however, became more explicit, divulging that the world of modern warfare was about to get much bigger. The cinematic followed some forces heading towards an Xville location, but fighting each other in Verdansk International Airport, with ghosts descending on it, trying to figure out what was going on. And as we pan out at the end of that cutscene, we see an airport and surrounding areas in chaos, with soldiers jumping from C-130, with a green cloud of gas in the distance. They really teased Battle Royale a month or so ahead of its time, an introduction later on in the middle of the season. That would then also introduce us to the middle slice of the main menu that was classified at the time. But eventually, that middle slice added a timer and a countdown to when it would unlock, which when it did, well, that was two years ago to the day. The very beginning of the global phenomenon that was Call of Duty Warzone launched on March 10th, 2020, and right out of the gate, players dropped in to explore Verdansk and as well to be the last team or player standing. So much so to the point that Call of Duty reported 15 million players in the first 72 hours alone, eclipsing that record total number of players in that span previously set by Apex Legends with its surprise launch. Day one Warzone was something else, man. We've talked about that here recently on the channel, going back and talking about day one of Verdansk, and I can put an annotation on screen if you're at all interested in learning about that in depth, but think bare modern warfare, bare Warzone. People had no idea what they were really doing. There was no movement and slide canceling just yet, no insane meta or weaponry that deleted you in two shots or so. It was a much more peaceful experience, perhaps? But despite what we know of Warzone and what it's become, I vaguely remember looking at viewership across YouTube videos, Twitch streams, and such, and seeing wow, I kind of thought this would do a little more, as if Warzone kind of had a lackluster start. But that's when it really all began. COVID-19 was something that was brewing from late December and festered, building up in relevance for the following months to come. But March, it was kind of at the forefront of the discussion in the world. I remember my 85-year-old grandfather, most cautious of people, was like, Jordan, if you have any work coming up where you have to travel or fly out, please consider don't doing it. It's getting kind of scary. And I kind of had to bite my tongue at that point because when he said this, like three days later, I was flying to Los Angeles to play Warzone and capture footage about a week or so earlier than the launch here so that we could build up and get things ready for the launch. But COVID was building up and shortly after the launch, that's when everything shut down. We all went into lockdown, like it or not, it was the reality that we faced. And while we were all stuck inside, many turned to gaming as an outlet. And this, in my opinion, catapulted Warzone to the next level. Usually with surprise game launches, you'd see that massive peak early on, which we did. We saw Warzone at 15 million players in 72 hours, but then it kind of started to slow down. Then, after the shutdown, Warzone, just a month later, was at 50 million players, a boom that was unfathomable to see, and that that's where the story, I think, really began. For all that horrible luck in the world at that time, Warzone became an outlet for so many. From here, we all dropped in, loaded up, and fought for our lives in Verdansk, from things like loadout drops being only 6,000 to where there was no real meta, guns like thermal HDRs being a mainstay, and no stock M4A1s being a primary, Warzone was an entirely different world. We had our first run-in with the environment, both in local Callan, literally, as Geo was the worst that it ever was initially, but from dam to prison, airport and boneyard to Krovnik farmland, the world had so much to explore and little did we know, we were only just getting started. April 8th of 2020, things for Warzone started to get into full swing. This is when Season 3 launched. One of the biggest adjustments that we saw was actually the introduction of quads. For those that don't remember, Warzone launched as trios only, so for quads to be coming out, that was a big deal. We had seen solos and duos introduced along the way, but quads opened up the potential for high kill games easier to manage lobbies perhaps with your friends since three additional sets of eyes are always better than two, and so on. Seasonally speaking though, while we were introduced to Alex, the new weapons, the Renetti, and the SKS, we really didn't get a whole ton in terms of major game-changing things added to the fold for Warzone, and that can be kind of understood really. I mean, Warzone was still in its infancy. The game wasn't even one month old at that point when Season 3 launched, so plenty of players were still finding the game, figuring out what to do, what worked best for them, and so on. As much as I know life didn't want to see more, looking back, it was totally understood why there really wasn't a whole ton added here to this. What was changed, however, was the first map change. Not like a new point of interest or something, that wouldn't actually come for another nearly four months into Season 5, but Season 3 introduced us to something a little bit more nuanced. We saw a story progressing through Modern Warfare's campaign into Spec Ops to then be continued in the launch of Warzone. That story then progressed throughout. Season 3's story was progressed by the first Easter egg of Warzone's kind, the Bunkers. Initially speaking, the bunkers we saw around the map were in various locations alongside other interactable items like phones and laptops, but 
to no avail before season three. You couldn't do anything with those. Here's where it became sneaky though, because season three introduced the red access cards. Those can be found around the map in different cash drops and other locations like that legendary crates. These cards could access bunkers that were found on the surface of Verdansk. There were multiple bunkers throughout the world, but some were underground and some were above ground or approachable via the ground. So for those that you could walk up to, these key cards could open the bunkers and give you high level loot, including the new utility item of the armor satchel, which would allow you to hold up to eight armor plates instead of the standard five. Initially, these actually worked as you may have expected, just give you the extra holding total. But if that feels odd compared to where it is now, well, it should be because they actually now, when picking them up, grant you a full eight armor plates. Whether you have zero, one, or five already, it'll bring your total up to eight. This was never actually the intention and the initial rollout of this didn't actually do that. You had the same amount of armor before and after, just allowed you to hold more afterwards. It wasn't until a later season that Superstore was incredibly bugged with a ton of cash, like I'm talking $10,000 and up, on the ground that the modern incarnation of the satchel came to be. The satchel was bugged at that point and gave a full eight plates upon picking it up, but that was an instance of a bug where players and developers liked it so much that they kept it even after the fix came in. However, back to these bunkers, with a high level loot, they were essentially decoys because there was one bunker that was more important than the rest, Bunker 11. The Bunker 11 was located in the northeastern portion of Verdansk, north of Arklov military base and east of Dam. There was a small section of a neighborhood that protected the bunker off in the hillsides. This bunker, inaccessible to anyone even with a keycard, was the lone exception to the if it's above the ground you can access it rule of thumb. No, this bunker was actually far too important. It was the byproduct of the first easter egg in Warzone where you had to activate a phone sequence on specific phones around Verdansk, listen to the message in Russian, and jot down the numbers rattled off to then go to corresponding phones and interact with them. This was very straightforward but a tricky easter egg because you had to know what phones corresponded to what number, you had to do them all in the exact order they were told or you'd have to restart, and you'd have to do it all in one singular game. That code though, the tricky part is that it changed every game too, so you couldn't memorize a singular path and you had to speedrun it. It got tricky, but if you did it, you were able to open up Bunker 11 where you could find a number of things. Tons of high level loot, a rare blueprint that would be credited to your account upon picking it up, that being the Mud Dropper MP7, and the foreshadowing of Warzone's story in the future. A deconstructed nuclear warhead inside a hidden area that you had to access through a crawl space in the bunker and see via an interactable red button that said, do not touch. It was a great easter egg and it set up a great year of storytelling and more to come. Now season 4, that had large shoes to fill in regards to what players were expecting coming out of season 3 and unfortunately it didn't quite fill them all the way. Season 4 was kind of a bit lackluster, a bit less exciting than season 3. Curiously though, there was no update to the map in regards to new points of interest or lootable locations, but instead, we got a train track system roaming the southwestern portion of Verdansk, but even stranger still, no train roaming it. Just a line of tracks that you could follow, and this of course would later set up the train that we'd see in the following season, but it was curious it was built out a few months before it was ever really had an intended purpose to go along with it. Beyond that though, we saw the introduction of the Fennec and the CR-56 AMAX, which would later become one of the most notorious weapons in Warzone's history, but that's a story for later. It didn't hit the meta immediately. Now, perhaps the most notable introductions though out of Season 4 for Warzone was in fact the quality of life change that we saw added during that point. With this update, we saw an introduction to some of the events that we had perhaps become accustomed to since then. While players could still fly through Verdansk hunting for high kill games, they would also see with Season 4 the new in-game events of the Fire Sale, Jailbreak, Supply Choppers, and Contraband Contracts happening for them, offering anywhere from discounted loot to exclusive rewards only available with that Contraband Contract system. Sort of like an easter egg, but you can complete a contract for it. This made for a lot of fun and variability in the gameplay loop, and while again, I in the moment longed for a bit more to do, it was definitely nice to see that we had some of these things become integral to Warzone at such a fun time during the year. Now Season 5, that's where Warzone perhaps saw the first real changes that we had in the world of Verdansk, and by this time, rightfully so, because many people were like, well, it's about time. The introduction of the Shadow Company, the ISO, and the AN-94 were perhaps the least of the introductions in Warzone at the time. Season 5 introduced us to new play spaces on different parts of the map, the most broadcasted of them being the opening up of Stadium in Verdansk, a location that was previously almost an entire quadrant of the TAC map in size, but was entirely inaccessible. So now it was entirely playable with a way inside the stadium itself, a parking compound below, an accessible pitch and lower and upper rotundas around the building, 
It was quite something and a lot of area to play, but that wasn't the only point of interest that was adjusted. Train station was also opened up with the entire interior now open to play in the main compound with multiple levels of loot and action to be found. Both options granted for some decent loot and incentivized dropping here, but what's crazier still is that that still wasn't the last of the map altering adjustments we saw added. Also added in season five was the new roaming train on those tracks that were added in the southwestern corner of the map. This was a solid place to drop initially, especially if you wanted some high action because most of these chests were legend chest, granting tons of cash and loot right up front. In terms of other quality of life changes, this is where we are first introduced to the Ascender or Zipline system. Introduced in order to combat camping of rooftops and one-way angles, as well as to traverse the map a little bit easier, this was a great addition. Things like getting on top of Stadium were now possible without a helicopter, getting on top of Downtown's tower as well, instead of just having to climb up those stairs and go through one doorway, you could fight enemies in different ways. Though, while Season 5 had a ton of standout areas as well, one of the most notable was the next easter egg we saw in Warzone. Following up on the success of Season 3's Bunker 11 easter egg, we saw the introduction of Stadium, bringing us a puzzle easter egg corresponding with a new set of key cards denoting locked rooms in either the parking garage, concessions area, or the administrative offices up top of Stadium. Each of these offered something special in terms of loot if you had the individual key cards, things like Specialist Bonus, the Advanced UAV, a durable gas mask, those were all obtainable from these locked rooms for the first time being introduced in their own right. But if you completed the puzzle that you could then start after opening up one of these rooms, you could end up getting into the administrative conference room and getting high level loot and the CR-56 AMAX Enigma blueprint. Again, continuing a short-lived tradition that we'd see of giving a reward blueprint for each seasonal puzzle introduced. It was a great time. However, perhaps the biggest noteworthy of items to players in Season 5 came a bit later on because we saw our first live event within Warzone. Now, up until this point, we kind of thought, okay, maybe it'll be a nuke event because we saw that teaser of the Season 3 nuke in Bunker 11. But the Black Ops Cold War live reveal event tasked players with collecting intel off of dead bodies or through chests locating a key, opening a classified chest, and then finding the weapon from Woods, which is a special SKS blueprint, which would then be credited to your account if you ended up completing that part. But at the end of that specified time, you were tasked with running to the stadium as air raid sirens went off and the teaser for Black Ops Cold War played in the back. And once complete, well, it triggered the worldwide reveal trailer of Black Ops Cold War and showed us the upcoming game to all players. A first of the grandeur and scale that we saw within Warzone, but not the last that we'd end up seeing. And that brings us to Season 6. With so much that has happened in Season 5, that had incredibly hard shoes to fill, right? Season 6 of Modern Warfare didn't offer as much quantity-wise, but for many, it was one of the best seasons that we had in Modern Warfare and Warzone, offering up content that connected with fans in a big way. For Warzone in particular, though, we saw another seasonal shift fundamentally to change up Verdansk as we knew it. Up until this point, we saw a few points of interest added in and a few additional features like trains, zip lines, and all, but with Season 6, we saw the introduction of these subway stations, introducing us to our first fast travel system, the first of two that we'd end up seeing in Verdansk's history. But the subway stations simply built out the underground of Verdansk a bit more, and the subway stations that we had seen since launch that were just walled off up until this point, what seemed kind of like scenic backdrops. Instead, though, we had these as fully functional offerings in Season 6, allowing you to take a predetermined line to another area of the map. This made for some quick exfills out of sticky situations, perhaps, or just faster ways to move and rotate around the map. Along with it, it also seemed like we were on a nice pace for what was an easter egg per season at this point, with the subway station offering up a new one. This time, we had to play around with paintings in the capital district downtown of Verdansk, matching paintings to puzzle clues that we had, and if you input them in time to escape the lockdown on the gas incoming in the capital building, you were able to then access the maintenance exit of the subway station, a stop that doesn't exist on the traditional rail line and was only accessible once you and your squad made your way to that line. Once inside the maintenance station, though, you were able to pick up a ton of loot, juggernaut suits, specialist bonus, advanced UAVs, loadout drop markers, and all, but the biggest reward out of this was the Firebrand Bruin Blueprint, a blueprint that for, at the time, was a main meta weapon and was a killer looking one at that. So that was three for three on awesome rewards for simple puzzles in Verdansk. Soon, we'd all be longing for more of those. But in addition to the subway station and the perks that came along with it, Warzone was introduced to the very first Haunting of Verdansk event, the first crossover that we had seen with major franchises since, if I'm not mistaken, Call of Duty Ghosts. The crossover was in celebration of Halloween festivities and what brought light to some customization options that saw operators turn into Billy the Puppet or Jigsaw, as well as Leatherface. Along with the thematic bundles, we also had our first in-season event of challenges, rewards and things to accomplish in-game, a trend that we'd see continue for quite some time going forward, happening at least once per season, each season, at least until 
this season, if I'm not mistaken, which there still is time with season two reloaded to have that happen. But anyways, on top of that, there were awesome zombies modes that were set in the newly Verdansk at night map, which made for some awesome tension and made for some atmosphere and play that was incredibly eerie in its own right. That would return a year following, but the sheer excitement and hype around the first one, I don't think will be beaten. The final bit of Warzone content, though, really before Modern Warfare's main year of support wrapped up, was in the way of the ending of the Warzone storyline. As we'll mention in the following seasons, the story continued, but if I were to guess, it's not really canon, and it will be retconned with the presumed Modern Warfare 2 later this year, but for the end of Warzone storyline, it was the ending of Modern Warfare 2019 storyline since it continued from the very beginning of the campaign. If you followed the intel missions from seasons past up until season 6, you'll know that Zakayev was moving on an attempt to launch the missiles in the underground bunkers and silos to enact World War 3. In our final cutscene that you get for completing the last tasks of the intel missions, you didn't need to finish all of them for what it's worth, it was just that final week's intel missions you had to complete, it showcased one final standoff between Price and Zakayev with Price throwing Zakayev over into the silo, killing him, and then having to make a last-ditch effort to stop the missiles from being launched. The storyline then effectively wrapped up all the way back from Season 3 and what we learned about that warhead that was hidden within the bunkers. At the tail end of this, though, it was meant to foreshadow potentially a Season 7 of content coming, given that in the game files there was everything you could expect for a new season, but it never happened. We ended up getting that content scattered about the following year, but it gave us our final piece to the 141 puzzle. One Soap McTavish, and thus, Modern Warfare 2019, came to a close. Which brings us to Black Ops Cold War Season 1. Following the launch of Black Ops Cold War, just a few days after that storyline of Modern Warfare 2019 was wrapped in the Warzone cutscene, Warzone was relatively stagnant. It was the first time since its launch that it wasn't really the main marketing focus. I mean, naturally, the corporate goal was to push as many sales as possible for the launch of a new game, so they put all their focus into that for the time being. That would also be heavily helped by some of the integration coming in Season 1, which, at this point, was the first time we'd saw that Modern Warfare would transcend Modern Warfare itself, and it had so many questions and technical hurdles along the way. The integration saw a shift in the Cold War ranking system, other smaller items as well, but specifically for Warzone, the biggest was the introduction of every single Cold War weapon. For the first time ever, we had a crossover of two Call of Duty games, where items weren't necessarily made obsolete after one year. Now, of course, this created a wild number of balancing issues with literal two-shot weaponry in the way of the DMR for months at a time, and then you had instant-melt weapons like the M16 and AUG alongside the FFAR. The meta of Season 1 was perhaps one of the most fun when it worked for you because you could just delete enemies but honestly miserable when it wasn't, when you're going up against other people that use those weapons. The balance, or rather imbalance, was honestly insane, but for the first time we had every single weapon across multiple games at our disposal, something that technically speaking was a feat in its own right. Outside of the inclusion of some 40 weapons or so, we had our first real major introduction to Warzone as well, with the introduction of Rebirth Island, playing directly into the plot of the Perseus leader Stitch. This new map, or rather returning map, for those that had played Black Ops 4's Blackout, this would feel just like home, minus the fact that you couldn't do things like climb door frames, the map itself felt incredibly familiar. This opened up the dichotomy of Warzone's Battle Royale a little bit. On one hand, you had to fight for your life, loot up, and survive in Verdansk, but if you wanted something a bit more hectic, something you could just mindlessly push enemies in that nature with redeploys for your squad, you could play Rebirth Island. It was an interesting split in what many players may have wanted, but a nice way to appease both groups. To this day, Rebirth is an insane amount of fun, and with a lighting change that was made in the seasons to follow, it made it even more enjoyable in my books. It started out with a yellow slash orangish hue, which would later be transferred to Verdansk, but I'm glad that's no longer an issue for either of those experiences. But Rebirth Island also introduced us to one final quest-based easter egg that we'd see in the mainline Warzone experience. It granted a blueprint reward at the end. The Rebirth Island Easter Egg saw you utilizing clues and briefcases left around the map to eventually open up the vault inside the headquarters building, to which if you did, you ended up getting the Red Room Milano Blueprint. Now, alongside the Rebirth Island introduction, we also had the Rebirth event, continuing on what we had seen in the haunting event. New challenges, rewards, and all to be had just for simply playing the game, and to this day, I think that the Hazardous Craig Blueprint, the one that was the completionist reward for that, was probably one of my favorite looking blueprints ever rewarded. And while the focus primarily was on Rebirth, a brand new map being introduced here, there also was a little bit of some map adjustments to Verdansk as well, which is kind of strange, and it's one that not a lot of people may remember. But underneath the airport main airstrip there, and also accessible by one of the huts on that airstrip, there was actually now a bunker underneath all of that. And it was reminiscent of the bunker that you have to break into in the KGB headquarters in the mission of Desperate Measures within the Black Ops Cold War campaign, but it was nice for a ton of 
of loot, a ton of cash, and you really got some nice utility out of it. So season one was filled up with festivities, but as the seasons went on, players may have also noticed that something else was changing behind the scenes. For those that were eagle-eyed at the start of season one when Rebirth launched, there was a ship off in the harbor or the distance, but as time progressed, that ship actually disappeared and was no longer on Rebirth Island. Instead, it made its way over towards Verdansk. And in the final weeks of season one, we actually saw this come off in the distance with a storm cloud overhead, getting closer and closer to the shore of Verdansk. That would then be our lead in for season two. Now, season two introduced us to the first real map change that we had in Verdansk since season six with the subway station, both in additions as well as for the first time, removals of areas. First, for additions, we had that ship, the Vodianoi, that crept closer and closer to Verdansk until it later crashed into the shore just west of prison below the port of Verdansk. Now, this new point of interest was home to zombie AI that you could interact with and get a bit of loot from if you ended up surviving their wave of attacks, though you often had to be careful because sometimes those zombies were the least of your worries when it came to enemies. Now, we didn't know it at the time, but this would be the start of the outbreak that we'd see throughout Season 2. For map additions, we also saw the introduction of three different silos around the map open up underneath previous statues set around the world. World. These silos were accessible where there was a missile inside each, but you also had a control room, access to high-level loot, and what was also the outbreak machine, showing the amount of contamination there was with zombies, and this would come in handy later on throughout the season, and also would introduce us to a lot of containment protocol alerts that would come up on screen and oftentimes be incredibly annoying. Also, kickstarting a little bit of some missiles that would go overhead as a sort of live event, but you wouldn't be able to really interact with those. Now, all that said, those were added, but what also would be removed were the subway stations, all of them closed off, and stadium once again was closed off, or rather that parking structure was closed off. There wasn't really ever any reasoning given, but the focus was clear. We were shifting away from the past and looking towards the future, which is kind of ironic given where we'd go next. If you guys remember, that was in the past. In tandem with these changes to Verdansk, though, we saw the Outbreak event itself actually start, both as an in-season event with rewards and such that we could complete, but also as an overall season-long event, which, without injecting too much opinion into this, was honestly pretty terrible to start the season. It didn't really do anything in terms of practicality until the final week of the season. Zombies just kind of would go from zone to zone, and we'd see the Outbreak zone with that zombie's danger in different spots, and also radiation progressing every so often as well. It wasn't until that final week that the Outbreak zones kind of got real, with multiple zones in each game and the radiation levels growing each match as it went on, that became a real hazardous area. This all led up into the preparation of the destruction of Verdansk event, a new live event that was sectioned off into two parts. The first part, on the eve of Season 3, saw you trying to survive a sort of old-school infected style of gameplay. If you get killed, you turn into a zombie, and if you turn into a zombie, you have to kill other surviving humans until there was no one left. Now, to my knowledge, even if you could exfil, you ended up holding off the horde as long as you could, there really was no way to win. But you ended up seeing the nuke go off and purge Verdansk, as they said in the cutscenes, Verdansk is lost, and then that concluded the perspective from Verdansk. Though with the launch of Season 3 coinciding, we saw the perspective of the disaster from Rebirth Island, where your crew is tasked with securing the nuke and actually launching it. We launched that nuke from Rebirth Island. There are actually different armored trucks that had missiles on their back here during this event as well. But if you ended up winning that match, you actually got to set the nuke off and trigger that alternate cutscene. But what made it cooler is that after you completed that, given that we are in the new season, you dropped immediately into the new map, Verdansk 84. Now, Verdansk 84 was the key item introduced here with Season 3, and like we said, you dropped right into it. Probably one of the coolest transitions from an event we've ever seen. But Verdansk 84 upset a lot of people, but also pleased a lot of people. It really just came down to what you expected. Up until nearly about a month before the launch of Verdansk 84, it was rumored that Fireteam maps from Cold War would be making up the new map of Warzone, given that we've seen these kind of in the back end leaked for quite some time, but that was for a Blackout 2.0 that was never really transferred to Warzone. That never happened, there were too many things that never lined up, so instead, Raven ended up giving us a Verdansk 84, a revamp of Warzone's Verdansk that saw new points of interest, new changes, features, and all. Things like Dam were replaced with Array, Factory was added between Superstore, Hangars, and Block, the Duga radar array was added north of TV. Stadium was opened up almost entirely, given it was a new project under construction at the time, and much more. All of this plus the 80s aesthetic was added. It made for quite a bit to learn, but honestly, not an overwhelming amount for those that played, but not like their lives depended on it. It was easy to pick up, but also still something new that you experienced for quite some time. 
In addition to the Verdansk 84, we saw the season start out with a quick Black Ops Cold War narrative themed event called the Hunt for Adler. And if you don't really remember this one, you're not to blame. It was only a week long for one, and it was also bugged the entire time. So while other events had you complete challenges and such, in the end, every single player was awarded that Adler skin that came away as that 100% completionist reward. For all the bugs and tracking and challenge issues, Raven just kind of gave it away. But even with a relatively new map and new weapons to play around with, Season 3 still had more to offer with perhaps one of the more favorite events happening at mid season, the 80s Action Heroes event, another event like The Haunting of Verdansk that incorporated real-life movie franchises into the game, bringing forth as actual operators this time, John McClane and Rambo from Die Hard and Rambo. We also saw that there were survivor camps added around the map from Rambo, and replacing the giant skyscraper in downtown was Nakatomi Plaza from Die Hard, replacing the under-construction skyscraper that was interestingly only there from the start of Season 3, so a couple of weeks and that's all we had with it. But with Nakatomi Plaza, we ended up getting an Easter egg here, kind of. You didn't come away with a blueprint like you have in other Easter eggs in the past, but the Vault Easter egg saw three separate possibilities here for outcomes. You could end up either doing a mission on the roof, you could do a scavenger contract, or you could end up taking enemies out in the sub-parking structure below Nakatomi Plaza. Now, each completion of this would allow you access to the vault itself, and if you were the first one in there, you got a ton of cash, plus whatever was in the sort of safety deposit box that you could open up, which was granted depending on what mission you did, but you could come away with a ton of cash, utility like an advanced UAV, special specialist bonus and things like that. So it was definitely worthwhile and it was a nice way once especially the season got underway and nobody really started to do it anymore. It was a great way to just jump in and get a really great early start early game before anybody else. You could get a loadout almost immediately, you could get a specialist bonus, and you could just go high kill hunting. Now after season three though, that's where things started to cool down a little bit once again. Of course we had our big major map introduction here, changeover, whatever you want to call it, so it's hard to follow that up. But for Cold War season four, we ended up seeing that we had the ground fall event happen happening here with us, where storyline-wise, Stitch was taking out different satellites, so therefore we had all kinds of different locations around the map with lootable locations for satellite crashes, but also there were recon-style contracts that would then allow you to crash satellites in your vicinity, in which you could end up getting things like advanced UAVs or harps or loadout drop markers for absolutely no cost, and right away, too. For these, the advanced UAVs, that of course was your advanced UAV that you knew of from previous Easter eggs, it would show ghosted players and all players in real-time directional location, minus the those ghosted players, but the harp, the Black Ops Cold War version of this here, was a little bit different. It didn't show ghosted players, but it lasted in over double the time for showcasing in real time with the directional carrot where those players are that were not ghosted. So both being beneficial, but each having their own separate uniqueness here to them. We also saw introduced here at this the red door feature, a new way to fast teleport to areas that had special loot. This kind of like the subway stations, but these a little bit more less predictable. They had fixed locations, but there were so many of them that you might not have actually remembered where each one particularly led. But once you were there, it was a locked off area that you could end up opening up a couple of chests, getting some high level loot, and then getting out of there. So not only was it beneficial to maybe escape a gunfight, but also to end up looting up quickly at the beginning of the game. Now, the Groundfall event was also something that came along with us here. Again, more in-game challenges and things like that, but a little bit more minor and nothing really too special outside of that. The only other big thing in terms of sort of quality of life that was introduced in Season 4 was the ability for custom mod support for Cold War weaponry, which which allowed you to save your blueprints easily. You could end up just quickly adding those to a class. You didn't have to mess around with any attachments. And that was something that was phenomenal. We had that in Modern Warfare, but not in Black Ops Cold War up until season four here. So three seasons later, Cold War season five looked to compound on this a little bit further, but it was kind of a miss in some regards to me. For this, the big thing that was marketed initially was the new mobile broadcast stations. These were in the game from the start of season five, but they actually weren't usable until the mid season update. So kind of just sitting there and not doing anything for a couple of weeks at a time. At the mid-season update, though, it gave you free cash if you were the first one to activate it, but they were incredibly hard to activate first because so many people were dropping on them. So with only a handful of them, you probably had contestion by five, six, seven players and up every single time. Now, we also saw that the red doors were updated here, which continued on the support of what we saw in the season prior, but this time, it didn't just drop you into a specific room anymore. It took you to a corridor of red doors, which would take you to different locations, so kind of like a landing location for this, and it allowed for multiple players to be in the red door system at once, which is why you could have gotten kicked out if you ended up going into a door and respawning over top of her dance, like flying back in. Now, we also saw for the first time in Season 5, 
new perks added as well. The perks of Combat Scout and Tempered were added in with Season 5. Combat Scout allowing you to have a sort of Oracle wall hack ping, almost if you want to call it that, for every bit of damage you ended up doing to an enemy. And then Tempered allowing you to refill your armor to 100% a little bit quicker, mainly because you just had to end up using two armor plates instead of the normal three. So something that shaved off a little bit of time here and is very helpful still to this day, I think. Now, with Season 5, we saw the numbers event added within mid-season. Again, some challenges here that played into the mobile broadcast stations, but not as much in terms of storyline as I would have anticipated, given that the numbers were so integral to the Black Ops storyline. Now, perhaps one of the biggest things in terms of maybe quality of life, if you want to call it that, that was added with Season 5, was Zombies Camos were finally added into Warzone. 268 days after the announcement of the Zombies Camos would be delayed in Warzone after the integration, we finally got them. That's something that we still don't have Vanguard's Dark Ether, but it also hasn't been 268 days since Vanguard's integration. So, we'll see when that comes, if it does come at all, but that was definitely nice for Zombies Grinders to finally have some representation here within Warzone zone camos on the Black Ops Cold War weaponry. Still one of my favorite updates within Warzone and Black Ops Cold War. The final thing that Season 5 really had to offer that progressed the evolution here of this was that we had one final reveal event here to date. That being the Call of Duty Vanguard reveal event, the Battle of Verdansk as it was dubbed, where instead of like the destruction of Verdansk in the event for Black Ops Cold War's reveal, they changed things up a little bit here. Instead of PvP, it was actually PvE. So everybody in the lobby, they couldn't shoot or do damage to other players. Instead, it was only towards that enemy AI, this being an armored train that you had to take out and destroy. And then you had to exfil, get to a location. But then we end up seeing all these bombers come in over Verdansk and they take you out to which it then queues up the Vanguard reveal trailer for that worldwide reveal. So another cool way to in-house debut something for the upcoming title in the Call of Duty franchise that honestly I think was a lot of fun still. Might not have been my favorite event, but still was pretty cool. Season 6 of Black Ops Cold War was one that was actually pretty packed. We had a lot of stuff to do here during this, and coming down to it fundamentally, the map changed again here. We ended up seeing fissures introduced in the map, which were cracks throughout Verdansk, things that opened up some underground portions here of this. Downtown Stadium, near Hospital, Hills Below Radio Tower, they all had massive cracks that opened up little craters that you could go into, some places that offered a little bit more cover, whereas there was none beforehand, but a slight adjustment to Verdansk as we knew it at the time. We also saw the introduction of three new bunkers around the map, which were old World War II style bunkers. And now that we knew at this point that World War II was going to be the setting here of Call of Duty Vanguard, it made perfect sense and it tied in perfectly. There was loot in each of them, decent starting locations, but unfortunately there was no Easter egg. Despite Amos Hodge from Raven literally mentioning Easter eggs by name in some of the marketing here, here for this, so a little bit of an unfortunate turn here to this, and personally, again, interjecting my opinion, I was a little bummed that we didn't get any major Easter eggs here throughout the entirety of Black Ops Cold War and the Warzone crossover. I mean, Black Ops is such a storied franchise littered with tons and tons of Easter eggs, but we didn't utilize any of that with Warzone. Kind of a bummer, but anyways, outside of that, the OG Gulag made a return here as a sort of returning back to day one, where we knew Verdansk was going to be the end here. This was going to be the final season of Verdansk in any capacity before we moved over into the Pacific. So to kind of pay homage to where we started, we went back to where we started with the OG Gulag. Now, we also saw throughout the season a couple of different events. We saw the Secrets of the Pacific event, again, a thing that you could end up playing around with and getting some new blueprint rewards and other items outside of that. We saw the Haunting event return once again here at this where we had, once again, another real-life crossover with the Scream franchise, this actually being a live promotion, actually, promoting the new Scream that came out a couple of months ago in January, and we, of course, had customization items, rewards in the in-game stream, and, of course, takes on some of those classic haunting modes that we ended up getting the year before. Again, like I said, this was fun, but I still think the first year was probably the better of the two if we were to directly compare them, but outside of that, we had a couple of things to completely wrap up for Dance, firstly, with Operation flashback. This being a way to sort of relive everything that we had out of the last year and a half since Verdansk was introduced with Warzone, where you had 11 different events that could happen. Jailbreaks, fire sales, supply choppers, cash drops, loadout drops, satellite crashes, hostile fire, which was that Nakatomi Plaza stuff, restock, resurgence, the juggernaut drops, the redacted weapon drops. All of those would happen with a new one happening each zone that would come in. So you had a ton of stuff here that you could play around with. The loot pool was some classic loot pool that 
what we had from seasons in the past. So it was something that kind of took the best of everything and tried to put it all into one game mode, which was a ton of fun and it was a nice way to sort of send off for dance. But the true send off came with the last hours of for dance. This was the final event that we had within Black Ops Cold War Season 6 after Vanguard here had launched, and it was the only playable playlist for Verdansk from the 6th to the 8th and marked the end of that era. If you won, you got an exclusive Final Victor calling card, and at the very end, if you stayed, you got a cutscene previewing the next stop, Caldera. A little bit of our first look here as to what we'd be seeing in the days following with Season 1's launch and that integration to come with Vanguard and all that would be coming to Warzone. So that was the end of an era with Verdansk, but also the start of something new here when we got to Vanguard Season 1 and Caldera, which this brought the biggest change to Warzone ever. Caldera, that brand new map, you could say goodbye to Verdansk, you could punch your ticket to the Pacific, but it's an all new world, new terrain, locale, everything to explore. For better or for worse, we got a whole brand new world here for this. A lot of people may have wanted this whenever we had Verdansk 84, just introducing us to a revision of Verdansk, but this time it was actually a brand new world here, something that no one had really ever seen this before. There were some small press events where content creators and media outlets got to play a little bit, a couple of hours of early gameplay here on this. But outside of that, nobody knew what the best drop spots were. Nobody knew what the best rotations were. Nobody really knew anything. But we saw a bunch of things introduced here in that regard. We saw Vanguard weapons integrated. We saw Vanguard Royale modes. We saw new planes, new vehicles, some adjustments here to some traversal of the Geo, though it was still bad in a lot of areas and still needs some work. We saw some fundamental changes like the loadout change. That was something that you couldn't buy a loadout before the very first loadout event, which was about seven minutes into the game. So it slowed down the pace drastically. That has since been reverted. The UAVs were increased in price. That still stays where instead of 4,000 like they were in Verdansk, they're now $6,000 in game. But that said, even though we had all of this stuff, it was something that should have been a great time for everybody to experience a brand new war zone, essentially. Not many could because it was an incredibly buggy and broken launch. There were a vast number of things for weeks to months leading after the season one launch where players straight up could not play the game whether it be from graphical errors whether it be from a bunch of dev errors and crashes whatever the case caldera and the experience there was almost unplayable if not unplayable for a huge amount of players so it turned off quite a few people made a lot of people very mad and thus we saw big dips in the player count that's something that to this day, they're still trying to recover a little bit here from this. And season one's launch, by all accounts, they even said was a failure. Unfortunately, I mean, we had a lot of really cool stuff at the prospect of season one. It just didn't roll out as best planned. Now, also introduced to season one here, kind of wrapping up season one, we ended up seeing that festive fervor event. I'd be remiss to not mention this here since we've mentioned every other event in every season past, but that was new in-game challenges as well that you could earn new items. But you also saw things like the Christmas tree around the map with Krampus as much of a pain in the behind as he was. He would end up going after players, trying to take them out causing a ruckus, but thankfully he's no longer there. The Christmas trees though, with the extra loot and the sort of recon contracts that it activated, that was a cool addition. If you could do that without Krampus, I think I would have liked the Festive Forever event a lot more, but that was season one, which brings us to season two. Now, season two, whenever it launched here, we got a lot of stuff, a lot of things correcting the mistakes of season one, but in terms of actual game updates and map updates, we saw a new point of interest. Factory was introduced here, which was integral to the story, which is manufacturing this new Nebula 5 gas, presumably the precursor to maybe Nova 6 gas and whatever is ended up using as the sort of gas for Warzone. We also saw new underground bunkers being opened up in hatches and things like that that would give you more loot if you could take out some AI enemies. They're not specifically located for what it's worth, but they're located in a relative vicinity by yellow circle marks on the player's tack map. So if you haven't checked those out, definitely worth it. But both have higher level loot and also introduce some new items. The Nebula 5 rounds, which replace stopping power. Those stopping power actually can show up here with the armored convoys. The Nebula 5 rounds, though, being a deterrent for a player that is downed by this because it will then emit this Nebula 5 gas that hurts a player if they're trying to revive that down player. The new PDS device, which will clear the gas, think the trophy system, but for repelling gas. That's a very very useful thing and can honestly help in some incredible outplay scenarios. We also saw the armored convoys, kind of like the train in Verdansk, where these ro 
roam on a static route, but will shoot at players in the area. If the player can take them out, they can get plenty of high level loot and tons of cash. And also, as of recently, the Nebula 5 bombs. This being a sort of, just like the outbreak event, contamination zone that spreads after the bomb has exploded, but then will fade eventually. Probably one of my favorite things though, outside of this season two introduction, was the new redeploy balloons to easily and quickly traverse the map. This increases the pacing tremendously, which was a big problem when it was initially introduced here within season one. But that said, all of this is capped off by that search and deploy event, which isn't actually an event that we know of in the capacity that we've had in the past, but instead kind of was like a way to roll out this new content. That's ending in a couple of days here and maybe replaced with this mid-season update if we get an actual event with challenges and rewards and such, but for the time being, that's where we're at. That brings us to today, March 10th, the two-year anniversary of Warzone. Now, where we go from here, well, there's a few things confirmed, others not so much. Right now, we know that there are some major changes coming to Rebirth Island here in the next few weeks with a mid-season update for Warzone Season 2, but to what extent, we have no idea. After that, the future gets a little hazier. I mean, Season 1 later this year with Modern Warfare may not lead to much of anything as we're going to be getting a new Warzone shortly after the launch of Modern Warfare, presumably two, maybe this time next year, one that is its own separate client, not tethered to any other premium games executable. Instead, it will be Warzone as it lives and breathes for the first time in its history. No spaghetti code, no fighting for application or memory resources, just simply Warzone. Something that can be built upon solely as Warzone, a new start. And the fascinating part out of all of this game's history to me is that it truly never was meant to be a standalone item. The decision to go free to play and transcend Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019 was made relatively close to the launch of Warzone, something that was just meant to be an additional for fun mode, similar to Blackout. But throughout the game's life cycle and not at launch, who would have thought that this would have catapulted Call of Duty back into the mainstream, brought back old fans and brought in many, many more new ones. That we'd see the likes of Call of Duty with tens of millions of active players, totaling well over 100 million accounts to date. Two years ago, we had no idea what was coming, and while there were plenty of faults and issues along the way, it created some damn good memories along that way. Warzone came out at a time when we all probably just wanted to forget the problems facing the world, and for the brief moments we experienced, maybe it worked. Two years have come and gone, and they seem like they've been the fastest years that I can remember. I don't know if that's more beautiful or terrifying, but I do know that with Warzone's success, more of those years are to be had for sure. More memories, more fun times with friends, either grinding out wins or high kills, or straight up shenanigans like unknowingly holding the Cali stick only when highest kill world record. That actually happened, fun fact. Whatever the future holds, I'm happy to have been a part of the path that got it here, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else it has to offer along the way. To Infinity Ward, Raven, all the caretakers of the game, through thick and thin, thank you for the experiences that you've given us. To those that have stuck around the channel or found something out of my content that you've enjoyed since the launch of Warzone, thank you for the support and being a part of our little community. Nay, family here on the channel. Your support means more than you could ever know. But for now, we look towards the future, ready to tackle whatever Warzone brings us next. So here's to it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.